Hey everyone and welcome to the Sunny Go One Piece podcast. On this episode, we're actually going to be taking a slight detour and I wanted to kind of dedicate an episode to talk about my recent trip to Japan, specifically my experience going on my One Piece statue tour around the Kumamoto Prefecture. And so, yeah, some of this is kind of spoiler up until the end of the Fishman Island arc. So where we are in the podcast, there may be some spoilers. I'll kind of talk about it towards the end and I'll warn you about what is actually spoilers. And so, yeah, but for the most part, yeah, I I guess I wanted to kind of do this a little bit scripted, but also be a little bit just sort of free form as well. So you may hear me kind of ramble on a little bit (laughs) at times. But yeah, I think the first thing I want to talk about before we get into the Kumamoto statue tour is there were definitely a lot of things One Piece related that were outside uh, of the tour that I also did in Japan that you may also be interested in. Probably the biggest things are the Mugiwara stores that are located all across Japan. And yeah, there are multiple ones. I think there are around 10 to 12 of them. I don't know exactly. I've been to about five of them, I think, by now. Uh, One thing that you may be interested in if you wanted to try and do it, I was never really all that into it, but you can buy these stamp books at any one of the stores. And then at each of the stores, there is a unique stamp that you can go and grab uh, from each of the stores. So if you're interested in collecting those, that's always fun. The Mugiwara stores are all different too, for the most part. They have different displays, different sort of statues. The products within them are mostly identical from location to location from what I can tell there may be a a few more things in some of the bigger locations Uh, like the Kumamoto one is actually pretty small compared to like the one in Osaka or in Tokyo and so yeah but the products are mostly the same I would say but the stamps things might be pretty fun for you and all the different displays are different like for example the Tokyo one has this huge uh, model of the thousand sunny and then they have the famous statue of Shanks putting a hat down and you can actually, you know, stand underneath it and be like Luffy getting the hat, uh, the straw hat put on you. Whereas Kumamoto had like giant statues of Sabo, Ace, and Luffy. Uh, The Osaka one, I believe, had uh, just just the Luffy statue. And then the other thing too, in addition to the Mugiwara stores, there are the Shonen Jump stores. So these are not specifically One Piece related but they're all of Shonen Jump's property. So they have various different stores located throughout the major cities like Tokyo and Osaka, which are the two that I went to. Again, the, between the two stores, they pretty much sell the same products, but they, they are laid out a little differently with different sort of uh, little small attractions, like different statues and figures that are sitting outside that, that you can take photo ops with and stuff like that. So yeah, both of those experiences were pretty cool is seeing uh, all over all over Japan, as well as some other, you know, more unsanctioned things like just, you know, Akihabara and like figure stores and all that stuff that you can go find One Piece stuff at. But yeah, so we'll kind of get into the main topic of this episode, which is the Kumamoto Revival Project. So this is a project that started all the way back in basically 2019, I believe, and it all stems from the earthquakes that happened in the region near the beginning of 2016. And in response to that, Oda, he donated 800 million yen, which is roughly around like, I think, seven and a half million at the time, just based on my research, to help reconstruct his hometown of Kumamoto, Japan, uh, after it was hit with two pretty massive earthquakes. Uh, I think both of them were around like seven on the Richter scale. And so, yeah, he not only donated the money, but he wrote messages as well as drew art for local products in local areas. But yeah, after sort of the rebuilding process for the the area of Kumamoto started, the governor uh, of Kumamoto announced that they would start building statues of the Straw Hats to kind of thank Oda for his help and his, his generous donations. And so... Yeah, they they commenced with the building of this with Oda, Shueisha, and the local government. And that's where the One Piece Revival Project was basically launched as the Hinokuni Reconstruction Arc in 2019. And so during during this time, they would build statues for each of the Straw Hat members, would be installed at the nine municipalities in Kumamoto. 
And in addition, they they also kind of added a couple smaller projects to sort of promote the local reconstruction effort as at the local level as well with little different festivals and different sort of events. Now the statues themselves were built by a man named Tappe Maruyama, a, who is a sculptor from the Toyama Prefecture. And there's actually a pretty cool video that was recently put onto the YouTube page detailing kind of like his experience making the statues, what it took to build them, what his thoughts on uh, the process was. And it's actually a pretty uh, interesting video. But yeah, I think one of the things that, uh, that was really interesting about this video is just how labor intensive bronze sculptures are. Because first off, what he what he has to do is he builds miniature, like one fifth scale clay models of the the statues to kind of get a sense of like what poses he wants to put them in, how much detail to put in them, as well as to also show them to Shueisha and Oda to get their feedback as well. Then what he does is he takes those and builds a larger version of it, and then ultimately he builds a full sized version of the statue, in which he makes a I believe it's like a resin model out of it. And then he he puts he, he makes a mold out of that. And then you put, obviously, bronze into the mold. And that's what you end up with the statue. And then you, you got to make all the different, you know, smoothing out, the finishing, and, and sort of the, the painting of it as well. Now, the statues aren't colored or anything, but there is some, there is a bit of painting to give it some more texture a, as well as some depth to it. So, yeah, it's a very, very difficult process. And he actually goes on to kind of talk about some of the the challenges of it, particularly, obviously, translating a 2D character into a 3D sculpture. Because from any one angle, something may look right if it's flat on pe- on a piece of paper or on a screen. But when you realize it into 3D, it, it kind of sometimes doesn't actually match up because obviously things are stretched and, and squashed and all that stuff or, or the aspect is a little different. But one of the big things he talks about in that video I thought that I thought was really interesting was how hard Brooke particularly was with his like thin bones and sort of the abundance of his like uh, hair follicles in his, in his afro as well as sort of the the furry feather boa that he wears as well. And the other th- the other cool th- thing that I never even noticed was that on Brooke's statue, he's playing a specific chord, and that chord is the first chord of the One Piece We Are <laughs> song, which is pretty cool. And yeah, so he, he worked he worked with uh, Oda and and the and Shueisha just to kind of make sure that the statues were accurate and that they would you know they not not only would they capture the spirit uh, of the of the characters themselves but also be very particular to Oda cuz we know how you know how much he cares about sort of the finer details of things as well and so one of the things that that he mentions are like how Oda made a comment about how Luffy's pupils aren't perfect circles or he would talk about how like certain clothing would would fit on a particular character, particularly like Usopp's, um, you know, his overalls and, and his bag and stuff like that, which was actually really cool to see that that much level of detail. And you can really see it too. When you, when you go up to the statues, like they are incredibly detailed and really cool to look out. I, I almost wish I had more time to just kind of sit and stare at them and really look at them. But yeah, it definitely, it, it really shows just how like almost like they're alive I think, you know, ironically, I think Luffy is probably the one that has the most like dead look in his eyes. Like if you look at him, he kind of lo- he doesn't he kind of loses a little bit of emotion, but it's still Luffy and and I think it looks good. But when you look at the other statues though, they all look like they're they're like alive, if that's weird to say. Particularly like Chopper, Nami, uh Zoro and Sanji and stuff like that. They they all look really good. And I particularly love the final character's facial expression, too. And I'm going to try and avoid spoilers about the final statue because obviously that hasn't necessarily been revealed in the series yet. So I will mention that later. So the statues themselves, all 10 of them, and again, I'll leave out the 10th one or at least the details of the 10th one. But yeah, so they the, the first one, obviously, Luffy, was unveiled on November 30th in 2018. Then next, it was Sanji, who was revealed on December 7th in 2019. 
Usopp was then unveiled on the next day on December 8th of 2019. And then Chopper, who was originally scheduled for March 28th, 2020, was pushed back until November 7th, 2020 because of the COVID pandemic at the time. And then similarly, Brooke was also scheduled to be re- originally revealed on March 29th, the very next day.、Uh, but he was also pushed back to November 8th, which was the Next day after Chopper's actual、uh, reveal date, Frankie was unveiled on November 21st of 2020. And then Nami was then next on July 31st of 2021. And then Robin was then unveiled next on October 9th of 2021. And then Zoro was the second to last, which was unveiled on January 22nd of 2022, just one day after my birthday, actually. And then the final character was unveiled on July 23rd of 2022. So, before I kind of get into my specific experience, I kind of wanted to mention a couple things if you were planning on going on this sort of trip yourself. So, one of the cool things is there are two apps that are associated with it that I had no idea about until I was told about them from my guide. They're by no means not required to enjoy the experience at all, but they're just a little couple fun things to do if you were if you were interested in them. So the first one is the Iko app, which is spelled I K O U. And this is like a digital stamp book where you can go along and get a digital stamp record of you visiting both the statue itself and the location where they sell the figures. Now, there's not really much to it other than being, you know, kind of like a fun little scavenger hunt type thing where you unlock special smartphone wallpaper for each character when you unlock the stamp. But yeah, I had a lot of fun with this.、Uh, you have to actually stand near the location of the, of the statue or the location of the little shop and get the stamps. I completely didn't realize that the shops also had stamps until about halfway through, so I didn't get all of them. <laughs> not that that really matters. But the other app that's also associated with this、uh, is the,、uh, and this one's a cooler one, I think. It is next to each statue, there are these two little signs.、Uh, one is obviously a, a picture、uh, of the actual character in sort of like a chibi form with the little、uh, blurb about why they're there and all that stuff. And the other one actually has a QR code with some instructions that will send you to an app called Coco AR. Which allows you to take pictures of the statues with AR filters over them that display like iconic dialogue and sound effects from the manga overlaid onto your picture. And so it creates this cool pic-、uh, picture of the statue, but it seems like they're in a manga panel. And it's really cool. They have each character has three different、uh, overlays that you can、uh, choose from. And I mean, you could take pictures of all three of them if you want, which is pretty much what I did for most of them. And so, yeah, I thought that was a cool way to kind of take like an extra set of pictures. And so, those are two things that definitely you should、um, look out for because I completely missed both of these、uh, until my, my guide kind of like told me about them. So, now let's get into the actual details of my specific trip. And the route that I ended up going with was I went to see Luffy and then Chopper. On the first day. Then on the second day, I went and saw the other eight, which is Zoro, Robin, Usopp, Frankie, Nami, Sanji, Brooke, and then the final character. Yeah, so my schedule, I spent the first day kind of starting at 9 a.m. and I went to visit Luffy and then I got some pictures and then went and looked for the figures, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And then Chopper、uh, later on that same day. By about noon, I, I went and visited the historic Kumamoto Castle to kind of like、uh, spend the rest of my day. And I actually spent a lot of time at this castle, which was kind of unexpected because I didn't think I would spend more than maybe like two hours there. I ended up spending like four and a half to five hours at the castle because I had a lot of fun. But the castle itself doesn't have too much to do with One Piece, other than they sell like this One Piece themed manju snack with One Piece packaging. And if you buy two products, You get like this、uh, special One Piece bag as well, which I, of course, did. But the castle itself is really fun. The manjus are actually pretty good too. And、um, yeah, I, I think I definitely recommend、uh, visiting the castle as it is a, f- it has a fascinating history、uh, just to kind of like learn about not only the castle itself from obviously, you know, feudal Japan, but also sort of the reconstruction of the castle because it, Not only was attacked and burnt down and then rebuilt, 
uh, but also then they've been slowly, systematically trying to repair it from the damage that it sustained through the earthquakes, which uh, were quite extensive when you look through the uh, the, the museum and, and and learn about like which parts of the castle broke, how they had to repair it, how they continue to reinforce it so that if another earthquake would happen, that it could withstand it. And yeah, walking around, you can see like, Definitely, there there is visible damage around the castle and the different um, turret towers, as well as the other smaller buildings, as well as some of the buildings are just completely missing. Uh, you can see like where they used to be, and they had to basically just dismantle and tear them down. And yeah, the one of the cool things about this castle, though, is like reading through all the different history, you can kind of see where Oda may have gotten inspiration from thir- certain things he included in One Piece. Uh, I won't really get into specific details on that, but yeah, if if you read, like if you're up on One Piece and then you read some of the history, you think, huh, that sounds kind of similar. And and like, yeah, there are things like with the Shibukai. I know the Shibukai weren't necessarily probably related directly to Kumamoto because that seems to be related to or inspired more from other pirate history. But you can kind of see like, where he may have mixed the two ideas. Another thing that, that's interesting is with a certain character named Momonosuke that you'll you'll meet a little bit later on. I feel like this character was also kind of based on a character that was uh, that was part of the family that originally lived in the Kumamoto castle. And so, yeah, it's very interesting to see like the, some of the parallels. I have no basis or fact on whether these were actual inspirations for Oda, but it just seems really coincidental that that some of this stuff it sounds so familiar. And if you ever go there or, or read up on the history, you'll kind of understand what I'm talking about. Now, the second day is where the craziness happens. So that day started at 8 a.m. And I went to the Ozu station near where Zoro statue is to meet my, my guy Keiko. And, and then from there, we went to each statue, spending roughly around 15 minutes at each one. With some variations, like spending a, a fairly good amount of time at the Nishihara village where Nami statue is for an extended lunch break. But along the way, we stopped at various vistas and points of interest, which I'll get into later that were really cool. But all in all, yeah, I from 8 a.m., we finished getting to the last statue at around 4 p.m., then about an hour from there to get back to downtown Kumamoto where my hotel was. So yeah, all in all, the second day was basically... From 8 a.m. to around 5.30 p.m. is when I ultimately finished my sort of tour, I guess you can say. And so, yeah, that that second day is really long. And I'll get into this a little bit more at the end, but I will say just at the beginning here, I guess we're kind of already halfway through, but this is a very difficult trip to do in one day or even two days. Like, I managed to do it in two days because I got the guide and, and I had someone basically who knew exactly where to go and in what order to go in, and we could hit them all. But if you're trying to do this by yourself or through public transportation, which is somewhat possible, it's very hard to do in two days. I would say almost impossible to do it in two days. It's probably just barely doable with three days. And and I'll, I'll kind of go into a little bit more detail later on why that is. Okay, so let's talk about the actual individual statues. And so, yeah, the first one I went to was Luffy, obviously. And so Luffy and Chopper are in downtown Kumamoto in in the Kumamoto city. And so from Luffy to Chopper, it's about a 20-minute railway or bus ride away and a little bit of walking. It's like, I think the whole distance that's covered is about 2.8 kilometers And so Luffy, of course, is at the center of the promenade of the prefectural governmental offices in downtown Kumamoto, kind of guiding the revival effort uh, as the captain. And one thing that I mentioned earlier is another thing that's added to this experience, if you want to, is in, in addition to seeing the statues, each location has some nearby shop or something where you can go and buy these limited edition collectible minifigures of the statues, as well as a commemorative card. Now, the the figures cost 2,200 yen, which is roughly around $14 each at the moment of recording. 
based on uh, exchange rates between the dollar and yen. Right now, the yen is incredibly weak, and so it's very cheap and affordable. And uh, the cards, the commemorative cards are actually free. So you can just go up to a lot of these locations and they will give you the cards for free. And so the first one I actually had kind of a hard time finding. Uh, so Luffy is uh, located at two different locations. So his figures is located at the Lawson, which is a convenience store, at the basement floor of the main building of the prefectural offices, or in the um, the Hotel Kumamoto Teresa. And right now, and this is another thing that I wanted to mention too, is so right now, from what I understand, is that Luffy, Zoro, and Nami are all sold out until a restock, which will happen in July. But the way you can kind of find out is through the Twitter account or X account at OP underscore KFPJ. And yeah, this account will basically update you on events surrounding the revival project as well as the stock of the figures now i didn't find this out until later so <laughs> i didn't really utilize this and so i was a little disappointed when we get to zoro and i'll talk about that but yeah definitely check back at that twitter account to see updates of when they restock and when they go out of stock and it's fairly accurate as it lags by only about a day and so yeah the the first figure was a bit of a challenge because i was walking all over the prefectural building and i'm like this tourist walking in the middle of this like governmental building <laughs> running into different people and, and trying to figure out where to go and they hide this thing really well because so it's in the basement of the the main building and so and it, and it's and it takes a specific elevator to get there because there there are two sets of elevators and there's like multiple buildings and so I went down the wrong one and ended up in this like basement, like this re legitimate basement area. Um, <laughs> and then I, I found the I found the real one finally. And so that was kind of uh, an interesting experience. But the card itself isn't sold or, or given out at the Lawson or I didn't go to the the hotel, but I went to the Lawson location. But the card itself is actually a floor above in the concierge area. And so if you go into the information area, you can ask the lady or, or the gentleman there if they could give you a card. And they also have different um, brochures that basically talk about, you know, the, the whole revival project. And depending on the location, so the Kumamoto Prefecture building didn't have multiple languages, but at the other locations, they have brochures for all sorts of different languages, both English, I think I saw Spanish... Uh, I think I saw French, German, obviously Japanese. Yeah, I think they had in total about like eight different languages, uh, if I remember correctly. So yeah, there's there's a brochure that kind of like tells you where each statue is, all the little blurbs about each one, the sort of the philosophy and, and the impetus for the project itself. And it's a nice brochure to have. And I actually brought back uh, two of them, one in Japanese and one in English, um, just to keep. And, and yeah, it's a pretty cool, it's a pretty cool brochure. So moving on, next I went and visited Chopper, who is found at the Zoological and Botanical Gardens. And of course, the association with animals is an obvious one with Chopper. But during the aftermath of the earthquake, the animals actually had to be transported to nearby zoos and other prefectures while the repairs were made because of the fact that the, the damage was so severe to the, the zoo as well. And so Chopper is here to kind of assist with that and help the animals as well. Now Chopper's figure... This was interesting because I went on a Monday morning and the, this happened to be the only day of the week that this place is closed. So he is sold at the main gate of the Kumamoto City Zoo and this place is closed on Mondays or any day following a holiday. And, and so I, I was a little sad about that. So definitely keep that in mind if you're going to go visit is the hours that these stores are open and when what days they're open when you go visit and plan your trip out. Because that's another reason why this is hard to do if you want the figures especially, is because most of these places are only open from 9 a.m. to like 4.30 or 5 p.m. And so they're, you have a very small window in order to hit all of them and also make the, the business hours of each location that sells the statues or gives away the commemorative cards. And so, yeah, what I ended up having to do is I had to come back to Chopper the two days later on the day that I was supposed to leave Komoto to come back to the U.S. 
And so I got up really early, took a bus all the way to Chopper at around like 8.45 a.m., waited for like 15 minutes for the place to open, and then immediately bought it, ran back to my hotel to grab my stuff, and then get to the airport. Um, So that was really a, a fun experience for sure. But yeah, definitely keep that in mind. So that was day one. Day two started off by going to Zoro. So getting to Kumamoto City from about where Luffy's statue is to the Ozu station is about an hour long bus ride costing anywhere between like 560 to 1000 yen. Uh, It's about 20 kilometers of distance covered. So it is a decent trip uh, going from downtown Kumamoto all the way to Ozu where Zoro is. Now Zoro is in the town of Ozu at the Central Park here because... This town has a fairly big kendo scene and community, especially among the kids. So he's here to help the kids of the area get stronger with their swordsmanship, as well as help the kids get through the hardships caused by the disaster. And Zoro's statue is really cool because he's in his iconic pose where he's lifting up his sword. And um, he's also really high up too compared to the other statues. Like there are, most of the other ones are pretty much ground level, but Zoro... Uh, for some reason, is elevated far above you. And I'm wondering if that's maybe because to kind of protect his swords uh, so people wouldn't, like, climb on them because they're really easy to grab and just climb on the swords. And I imagine because they're they're rather thin, they maybe you know, they could potentially break off if people started to try and hang on them. So that may be why. Or maybe because if the swords were at ground level... You could have people like accidentally tripping and like getting impaled by them. That may also be another reason for why he's built so far up compared to the others. But yeah, Zoro. So I was super disappointed when I got to trying to find Zoro's figures. Because unfortunately, I had visited at a time period where one of Japan's like major holiday weekends had happened, which was Golden Week, where a bunch of different national holidays all basically line up consecutively, whether that be the Emperor's Birthday, Children's Day, uh, Girls' Day, uh, and some other holidays. They all line up. Uh, it's like there's like five of them in a row, and it's called Golden Week. And so a lot of people go on vacation. And so one of the things people, a lot of people did was come visit Kumamoto and the statues for their holidays. And so, yeah, when I, when I got to Zoro's location... And Zoro is actually sold at two different locations. One at a hobby shop called Hobby Shop So, and then the other is the Ozu Roadside Station. And both locations were already sold out of Zoro by the time I got there because of Golden Week, apparently. And yeah, we kind of talked to the, the, the shop workers and stuff about that. And so, yeah, that was a huge bummer, not getting Zoro, because obviously, as you know, Zoro is my favorite character. But... I did manage to find him on eBay for a reasonable price. I mean, I ended up paying definitely a markup for sure. But yeah, I still found him at at a reasonable price. But there are some people that are selling these figures for exorbitant costs. Like I saw when I was looking for Zoro, I saw a couple figures that were being sold for like almost $100 when they're, you know, like I said, they're only about $14 uh, if you went and bought them. Obviously, it takes a lot to get those figures because not only do you have to fly all the all the way to Kumamoto in southern Japan, but also travel to each statue and get them. But I still think that's way too much. But anyways, I did find one for a reasonable price. And so, yeah, I do have a complete collection now, thankfully. The next statue I visited was Robin. So from going from Zoro to Robin, it's about a 22-minute drive, about 14.3 kilometers away from it located at the former Tokai University in Minami Aso Village, which has been converted into the Earthquake Museum. Now, there is a way to get here by bus, but it'll be hard as there's no actual bus that goes directly to the museum. Instead, it drops you off at the Aso Farmland stop, and you have to walk about 1.8 kilometers, which is about a 20-minute walk away. And so... You do have to do a decent amount of walking to get here. And also the buses are pretty infrequent because you're like pretty far up into the mountains by this point. Yeah, so this one is definitely one of those ones where it helps if you had a car. Like if you rented a car or you got a guide like I did who has a car. But again, it's still possible if you're willing to kind of do a little bit of walking to get to this uh, location. So Robin is here, obviously, as a scholar and archaeologist. She's right at home at a former university. 
And this isn't just any university, but the school that uh, Eiichiro Oda went to himself to study architecture. But of course, he never went on to use any of these skills, as while he was still in school, he had begun submitting manga to Shonen Jump at this time. And I tried to do some research, and I don't think he ever even actually graduated, because I think right after this, he basically just went on to become a mangaka and, and you know, begin writing all the various sort of one shots like Romance Dawn and all the other shorts that were found in Wanted. And then, of course, he then went on to write One Piece. And so, yeah, I don't I, I couldn't find any record of him ever actually graduating from here. Yeah, the university is a, re- is a fairly small campus. Uh, this is just an offshoot uh, of the Tokai University. And so this is sort of like a satellite school for the, in the main Tokai University campus. But man, this place was re- ravaged by the earthquake. Like the, it, It's interesting because, they, because it, there was so much damage, they essentially decommissioned it. And, and so now it just kind of stands as a monument to the earthquakes because the damage is so extensive. And I was kind of like, it, it's kind of overwhelming really when you look at it because it, it's just like a building that used to be here for people to go to school and go to class. And, and you can see like, like this huge crack in the ground. Uh, you can see like the different segments of the building just like cracked open. And, and, and some, in some cases, they actually had to remove large sections of the, uh, of the building and, and basically prop it up using like reinforced girders and, and stuff like that. And so you'll see like these huge chunks of the building missing as well as like just a whole bunch of damage, like stairwells, like just completely demolished. The parking lot is just completely uneven. Like the concrete is just like jagged as hell. But yeah, this was a pretty eye-opening experience just seeing like just how devastating the earthquakes really are. Now, I didn't get to go see the um, the museum that's attached to it. And I'll kind of talk about this a little bit more towards the end as well. But there is a museum attached to this location that's also pretty cool to see. Now, Robin's figure can be found at the the um, Kyoku Earthquake Museum, uh, which is where I ended up getting it. It's just at this little uh, gift shop just in front of the parking lot. And then there's also another place that you can get it as the uh, the Kugino Roadside Station in um, the Ajiwaikan. And so, yeah, these two locations, you can get Robin. Robin was pretty easy to get. There wasn't really any sort of stock issues with that one. Now, moving on from Robin, I went to Usopp, which is a 25-minute drive or 13.7 kilometers uh, down the down the mountain uh, to the Aso station in Aso City, where this area is pretty well known for its agricultural presence in the area, producing all manner of different crops like rice, wheat, various fruits and vegetables. And yeah, of course, Usopp is perfect here for utilizing his great knowledge of plants via his pop green special attacks. And this makes it a perfect place for Usopp to be in to kind of assist the the farmers of the area. And so Usopp's figure can be found at the Aso Roadside Station, which was actually a really cool place, to be honest. Like, uh, Usopp's kind of just like hanging out in the middle sort of parking lot area in between the station and and the roadside um, little shop there. And yeah, I, I, I really I really like this place because it's like pretty rural. You're surrounded by mountains and like a whole bunch of greenery. It was a really beautiful place. And speaking of the, the greenery and the mountains. So next, instead of going straight from Usopp to the next statue, my guide actually took me to the Aso Volcano, which was just a little bit above Usopp. And so this was about a, a little bit of a detour for sure. We also ended up going to the volcano, the Aso volcano, which is an active volcano. And this was a really cool experience. And I think this is one of the cool things uh, you can do if you're not a One Piece fan and you just wanted to visit Kumamoto because the volcano was actually really cool to see, to be honest. I think that's the first time I've ever been that close to an active volcano. And it got to a point where it was so smoky that <laughs> I even started kind of coughing. So definitely if you have any sort of respiratory issues, I would, I would actually avoid this place because I, I can see how someone with with sort of respiratory or heart issues or someone dealing with asthma or something like that it could be pretty hard uh because even i was kind of struggling after a little bit uh being up there but other than that yeah it's a it's a it's almost otherworldly it felt like 
another planet to to kind of like walk particularly the desert the volcano desert there's like this flat area of just like all this like rock and stuff and yeah it looks really crazy cool and then on the way down we also stopped at the uh, minami aso panorama observation deck which was really cool to see kind of looking down at sort of the rural areas of Kumamoto all the way from like about maybe halfway up the mountain. And that one was really cool to see as well. Now going down from the panorama observation deck, then we get to Frankie. Now distance wise, Usopp to Frankie is about a 40 minute drive that covers about 30 kilometers. I, because of the volcano, we probably took like, uh, I don't know, like a six or seven kilometer detour. And so yeah, that would take you to the train station in Takamori. And in order to get to Usopp to Frankie by bus, or, or I guess more, I, well, you could also do train, but that takes a while. It's like two hours from my research. And that was another reason why I didn't end up doing just my solo trip without a guide, because again, these trains and buses run so infrequently uh, and they take so long that you can only fit so many statues, like th- maybe three each day. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it becomes very difficult to to do all of that. But yeah, like I said, Frankie is located at the Takamori Station. And Frankie is here to re- help rebuild the, rail- the railways, which were damaged during the quakes as well, using all that he learned from Tom while working to build the sea trains, like the Puffing Tom and the Rocket Man. And the other thing, too, is the Thousand Sunny Train is located here as well, so he kind of looks after that. And I was lucky enough that the train was actually there. It's kind of a, it's kind of luck of the draw to, to whether the, the train is there or at another location. But I thankfully got to see the train as well. I didn't get to go inside of it, unfortunately. But I got to see the outside of it. The lobby of the station is pretty cool too, with a little corner dedicated to Frankie with like his Jolly Roger flag and a bunch of Coke vending machines. It's a really cool little display that they have there. And in the opposite corner, there's also an area where you can see like a bunch of artwork and autographs uh, posted up on the wall from various mangaka that were sent to show support to the area, including Oda, Mayumi Tanaka, and Kappe Yamaguchi. Both the voice actors for Luffy and Usopp, respectively, uh, have little signature or autograph little things uh, hanging up there as well. Now, talking about Frankie's statue, his was pretty cool in the fact that he's in his iconic super pose and he's also easily the tallest. He's massive in terms of his size. And in fact, I think in the video, the sculptor mentions the fact that balancing him was a little bit more difficult which is why if you walk around behind him he's actually standing up against three barrels of cola which is a very fitting uh decoration to add to his statue but i think it was also there to sort of reinforce and and sort of create a a more uh larger center of gravity for the statue and so i thought that was a cool workaround for that issue and it's a very interesting way to look at uh frankie now obviously the Frankie figure can be found at the Takamori station. So that one's pretty simple to find. The next stop was Nami. So going from Frankie to Nami is about a half an hour drive that covers around 23 kilometers. Via via bus, it'll probably be around like 47 minutes to get there. So yeah, Nami is found in the Nishihara village at the Tawarayama Koryukan Moeno Sato or the uh, Tawarayama Exchange Center. And Nami is here because prior to the earthquakes, there used to be a lot of windmill uh, electrical turbines up here. And they were damaged in the earthquake to the point where they have all had to basically be removed. And so Nami is here to kind of lend her weather and meteorological skills uh, to help the, the rebuild process of those uh, wind turbines as well. Now, this location was pretty cool and very beautiful as well. I didn't get to explore it as much as I would have liked, obviously. But yeah, this is the part place where I probably spent the most time too, ironically, because this is where I ate lunch and um, Nami actually has her own dessert here, which is like this like soft serve uh, mikan or tangerine flavored soft serve dessert. And it was actually really good. I recommend getting this. It's actually really good. Uh, it's a, they give you a lot too. 
but I managed to finish it all. Yeah, and, and so this is this place is pretty cool. It's like on a she's at the base of the hill, and you can even walk up the hill. And sometimes, depending on the 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 time of the year, like the pictures that I've seen, it, it gets pretty beautiful with like the sprouting flowers and all that stuff. When I went, there weren't as many flowers because I think maybe it was past that time. It's already getting into like the summer time period more so than spring. But Nami's statue was pretty cool. I, I like how, so she's sitting on a treasure chest, obviously. And one of the cool things is that you can see around the base of her statue, there's like a bunch of berry coins. But among the berry coins, like people who would come to visit would actually throw real yen coins on there. So you'll see like all these uh, coins just litter at the base of her, uh, of her statue for people to pay tribute to her and, her, and, and give her money, which I thought was really cute. Uh, the other, the other interesting thing about my experience going to this place was, uh, I happened to be the person that bought the very last Nami figure. <laughs> yeah, it was, there were two people. So there was one other dude. Uh, I think he was from the U S uh, he looked white. We were both uh, in li- in two separate lines. And so they, they grabbed the figures out of the, out of a box in the center and literally both of us. Like he bought one, and then I bought the next one. And apparently, the lady that that gave me that gave me the figure, she's like, "Oh yeah, you just got the last one." Like you and he got the last one. So, yeah, I got really lucky. Unlike Zoro's uh, situation, I got really lucky with Nami and the fact that I literally bought the very last one. Now, obviously, like I said, they'll restock. They they said that they're gonna restock them in like January or not January, July. And so. Yeah, it's not like I bought the last one in existence, but yeah, that was a really, f- really fortunate uh, thing to happen for me that I managed to get a figure for Nami and that the only one I missed was Zoro. All right, only three more left to go. And so from Nami, I went to Sanji, which was a 20 minute or about 21 minute drive, about 15.3 kilometers away at the Mashihiki City General Gymnasium. And the story behind why Sanji is here is that during the earthquakes, many people were displaced from their homes. And so those folks came here for temporary housing and shelter as well as meals so that Sanji is here to kind of help serve meals for the kids as well as the local school lunches and kind of support the community in that aspect. And so, yeah, I thought that was a really cool uh, representa- uh, representation for Sanji as he's yeah he's located behind the the gymnasium kind of facing the the fields like the track and field and soccer field and baseball fields and he's kind of out there it's kind of all on his own and it's actually a pretty cool vista really and, and you can see sanji he's holding um the a plate of food and apparently through the the documentary about the sculptor he also mentions how oda was very particular about what he put on sanji's plate uh, that he's holding there, and so, yeah, it, it's pretty. It's pretty interesting. I can't really figure out like what specific dish is on there, but you can kind of tell it, it's uh, it's like the the seafood dishes that he prepares. It's almost kind of similar to the fried rice, the seafood fried rice dish that he prepares for Ging on the Baratie arc, but it it's, it doesn't really have much rice in it. It's mostly bigger pieces of seafood. So it's not quite that dish. I don't know if it actually makes a specific appearance in the series at any point, but it does look like various bits of it have. So getting Sanji's uh, figure was an interesting experience because so this is like a, you know, a local municipality. So it's a governmental building. And so when you go into the, the, the general gym area, there is a recep- front reception area, but it's almost like a government building. Like it felt like kind of a, a little office you would go find, like almost like a DMV almost. It's, it's a lot nicer and less crowded. But yeah, you have to go up to a kiosk and basically buy something for t- like a, a ticket for 2,200 yen. And then what you do is you take that ticket up to the window and then they give you the card and the... Uh, figure which is interesting and one thing that I, I that that was a quite of an interesting anecdote from my guide is the fact that I and, and in talking to the attendant at the window who I bought the figure from was that Sanji isn't that popular in uh in Japan for some reason or at least among Japanese uh people which I find interesting because 
In the popularity poll, Sanji is almost consistently number three, just behind Luffy and Zoro. The only time was he got knocked down by Law once、uh, into the number four spot. But yeah, I found that very interesting that Sanji's figure isn't all that popular. And so there's like a bunch of them、uh, compared to the other characters. And then from Sanji to Brook is a 17 minute drive or 10.3 kilometers. And Brook is in a town called Mifune. And this is a great location for him for a few reasons, actually. One is that the Heisei College of Music is nearby, which relates back to Brook's role as the musician of the crew. And also, this area is pretty well known for its abundance of dinosaur fossils that have been found. And the Dinosaur Museum, that's also kind of just down the road from Brooke's statue as well. And so, obviously, you know, being a skeleton, he's a bit of an expert on bones. So, that's also good. And it's also said that additionally,、uh, Brooke's here to support everyone with mental health with、uh, livening up people's spirits with his、uh, <laughs> skull jokes. And so, yeah,、uh, that's kind of Brooke's main purpose for being here. And you can find Brook's stat- or figure at the dino base in Mifune, which is basically in the same sort of field as where Brook's statue is. I think, and this is kind of, I think this one might actually have been built specifically for Brook's statue because there's like nothing else nearby. And then there's just this small building here, like this little gift shop area. So I almost think that. This one was built specifically for Brook because it's just a little building that's across the little、um, field where Brook's statue is and where you can get like little snacks and a bunch of dinosaur themed、uh, gifts as well as Brook's、uh, card and figure. And they also have this, similar to、uh, Takamori Station with Frankie, there's like this little corner dedicated to Brook where they had like a skeleton dressed up as Brook and like they have uh, Brook's uh, Jolly Roger flag hanging up on the ceiling. Uh, and it looks pretty, it was pretty comical,、um, but this was also a pretty interesting one. And yeah, like I mentioned with the, when I was talking about the documentary for the、uh, sculptor, yeah, Brooke's statue is incredibly detailed. And I, I remember in, in the video, it talks about how you know, he, it got to a point for the sculptor, <laughs> he was like, you got to be kidding me with this when he was making this, because yeah, it, it's pretty funny. <laughs> How he describes his experience trying to build Brooke's statue because it seemed like it was a pretty tall task to do. But yeah, I mean, it, ter- it turned out great. Like, his statue looks amazing. And the, the pose, the, the details are all really well realized, I think. So he did an amazing job. Okay, so like I mentioned, this final character is a bit of a spoiler. So. Uh, spoiler warning from here on out until、uh, I'll try and make a little chapter thing so that you can skip this area if you don't want it to, to talk ab- or want to hear about this section. But yeah, I'll,、uh, I'll include that or at least I'll try to. And, but if not, then definitely maybe skip like the next, I don't know, three, four minutes、uh, or so. But yeah, so getting on to the final statue, we get the Jinbei. And yeah, so Brook to Jinbei is a long drive. It's 40 minutes, it's about 26 kilometers.、Uh, by bus, it'll probably take you about an hour and a half to two hours to just get there.、Um, even from downtown Kumamoto, it'd probably still take you about an hour and a half by bus to get here. It's probably easily the longest and most out of the way statue. And, and if you're thinking about it from like the perspective of Jinbei to Usopp, who's on the other end of the prefecture, It is a very long drive, probably close to like two and a half to three hours, but totally worth it, I think. Especially if you kind of go in order, if you start off, you know, far, far east and then go towards the west, it's a lot better. But yeah, we finally get to the seaside in Uto City、uh, at the Sumiyoshi Seaside Park, where Jinbei is beautifully sitting just in front of the water. And this one's pretty obvious being a fisherman, he would be near the water. And on the, uh, on the little uh, brochure, Jinbei is here to support sort of the reconstruction of the Uto City Hall building, which was on the brink of collapse after the earthquake and basically needed to be almost reconstructed、um, from scratch. And so they're, I think they're still in the process of building that. And so, yeah, he is located near the water. And this place is gorgeous. And I got really lucky with the weather, too. It was, it was clear skies and sunny. And it looks amazing. And Jinbei is massive. 
Yeah, he is huge. I, but I really love, like, he, he kind of briefly mentions it uh, in his video about talking about Jinbei in that he wanted to build Jinbei to make him, you know, fearsome as he is, but also really friendly at the same time. And I think they really accomplished that because, like, Jinbei is huge and imposing, but his face is, is um, really happy. And he's, like, kind of inviting you to, to sort of drink tea with him. And it's pretty... It's a really I like Jinbei's face. Um, he probably has one of the most lively faces of all of them. Uh, him and Nami, like Nami's face, also looked really like I don't know, full of emotion. Like you can really tell that it's her. And Jinbei's is another one. I think yeah, like I said, I think Luffy's face is the only one that kind of like strikes you as a little sort of in that uncanny valley. But maybe Robin a little bit too. But I think Robin still is pretty good. But everyone else looks amazing. Uh, between Frank, well, Frankie and Brooke are pretty easy because they don't really have eyes. Like Frankie's wearing his sunglasses, and Brooke, he doesn't have eyes because he's a skeleton. And so, yeah, I think I think they're pretty easy. But between Zoro, Usopp, Chopper, uh, Nami, Jinbei, they all look really good. And, and Robin looks pretty good too. But yeah, uh, Jinbei's uh, statue. This one I know because the guy told me. But this. The guide said that the Uto Marina roadside station where Jinbei's uh, figure is sold was built specifically for this purpose because before it was built, Jinbei's figure was sold at some uh, local store down the road. And then it was only recently until this place was built where they started building uh, Jinbei's uh, figure. And it's pretty cool. Uh, it's just like a small little con convenience store type of thing. But they had... You could try Jinbei's favorite seaweed uh, treat there, and I got to taste a sample of that as well. It was actually not bad. And yeah, this is a pretty cool place to, to just visit, even if you're not interested in uh, the, the Jinbei statue. And so yeah, that kind of completes the entire trip, and yeah, that was a really long trip for sure. That kind of ends the spoiler section. From there, I got dropped off at the Uto station and then rode the, the train back to downtown Kumamoto, which is about an hour or so, about 26 kilometers, where I stopped at the uh, Amu Plaza Kumamoto Shopping Center, where you can find a smaller Mugiwara store on the sixth floor. And the other cool thing is in the entryway, there's this cool waterfall display with a mural of a huge version of the color spread from chapter 992, which is kind of like the official mural picture of this of this whole project. The other thing too is you can find the on the cover of chapter 843 is the cover for the guidebook and also the uh, what should we call it? The manju treats, the the box art and the the bag that you get for buying those at various locations, particularly the Kumamoto Castle, like I mentioned earlier. And so between those two pictures, they, they kind of became the official artwork for this project. But yeah, you can kind of go see that. And there's like a massive version of the 992 color spread uh, on display in the, uh, in the entryway for the, uh, the mall there. And it makes for a great sort of ending point for, for the whole tour as you basically stop off at the Mugiwara store. So yeah, all in all, this was such a fun experience, but it can be quite exhausting for sure. Like you're doing a lot of traversing in a very short amount of time. Like if you try to fit it in one or two days, I think it's very difficult. I think the optimal time to do it is three days. And in fact, if you try to do this without a car, like if you don't rent a car uh, or know somebody who has a car or, you know, find somebody to drive them around. It's basically impossible to do this in two days. Like, you will need at least three days if you're trying to do this with, with just public transportation. Like, I didn't have that much time, so I instead hired a guy to drive me around uh, the second day. And that cost me about 32,000 yen, which can, you know, it actually gets cheaper the more people who sign up for a specific day. And I signed up for an open session, um, but luckily for me, no one else signed up for that day. So I basically got a private tour for the cost of a public one. And yeah, this uh, this guide I was referred to, um, Keiko from Nature Lab Guides, who does guided tours around Kumamoto, and she was great. She had she hadn't really read One Piece from talking to her up until I think she read volumes one through five because they're ch they're they're free. 
Um, so that's up to the Sarah village. But she was extremely knowledgeable about the statues, the surrounding areas, and all the different um, uh, visit vistas and tourist spots. And she's also great for English-only tourists as well. Like she can speak English fairly well and communicate and, and do the tour in English. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend her. Um, if you're interested in, in you know finding out how to reach her, um, DM me on like Instagram or Twitter. And I can certainly refer you to her as well. And yeah, the, the whole experience will kind of vary in cost depending on what you want to do and what you want to get out of it. You can, of course, do it on the cheap by just visiting the statues using public transportation only. It'll probably cost you around like fifty to eighty dollars in sort of bus and rail fare. But of course, like I said, you know, because you'll have to stay a few more days, it'll cost you a little bit extra in terms of added hotel or lodging costs uh, for a couple more nights of stay. But yeah, the figures, if you want the figures, like I mentioned, they're going to be 2,200 yen each, which at the time of recording is around $14 a pop. So it'll cost you, uh, you know, $140 for just the figures themselves. For me personally, it was so worth it to pay for the guide because despite its seemingly steep price uh, of the 32,000 yen or $203 at the time of recording, I feel like I got my money's worth with with Keiko's great service, with her commentary, and also her willingness to take any number of pictures for me and, and basically showing you exactly where to go to buy the figures to save as much time as possible. Addition, additionally, like like I mentioned, we got to go to the Aso Volcano and she kind of showed me where all the different vistas are, which you know is included in the cost, so she can just kind of go right in as she seems to give many, so many tours that the gate attendants seem to know her and just let her right in, which was cool. And yeah, so like I mentioned, I originally tried to plan it out to do it on my own using nothing but public transportation, but it just got to a point where it was really unrealistic as there would be points in time where I'd just be stuck in places for hours because the bus would only come every few hours. And there are, are, of course, certain places I wish I could have stayed longer had I just gone by myself to just kind of explore the area a little bit more. Two specific locations were Robin Statue and Brook Statue. So Robin Statue, where the Earthquake Museum was, I couldn't really see the entire museum since we didn't have a lot of time there. But in exchange, we did stop at a scenic location above the Aso Bridge on the way to her, which was incredibly beautiful. And also kind of somber as well, learning how the bridge was destroyed in the earthquake and it had to be rebuilt during a time which was really difficult for a lot of people because of the way the geography of the area is built. It's it's a caldera that's surrounded on almost the entire side uh, by a mountain, kind of like a crater almost. And so this bridge was like one of the few ways to get in and out of the of that area and without that bridge, basically everyone had to be funneled through the mountain pass, which is a much you know narrower route, making it extremely difficult for residents of the area at the time to kind of go between the cities and and, and their homes. And so, yeah, I, it's it's amazing to see like the the transformation that that happened to build this brand new bridge in such a short amount of time. But it's also in terms of like outdoor and nature uh, vistas, this was really a beautiful place to see because, yeah, you're kind of just standing there and looking into this like valley area. But then around you is just surrounded by these lush green mountains. Uh, it looks crazy cool. Now, the other uh, the other place that I kind of wish I had a little bit more time with was at Mifune, where Brooke statue is, where we, you know, I kind of wanted to go see that dinosaur museum. <laughs> Um, that I mentioned earlier, but of course we didn't have time for that. But uh, all in all, though, yeah, I was really satisfied. Like, I think in closing, if you're a fan of the series, I highly recommend this as it's so fun and it supports the rebuilding of the city. And I learned so many fun things about the city and its history, uh, about One Piece, the series and the characters. Kumamoto is also a, a kind of a different experience from other big cities in Japan, too. And that, you know, once you leave downtown Kumamoto, you really get to see more of the rural areas of Japan. And it's it's a really great outdoor experience to see a, a whole bunch of things that you don't really get to see, like if you were just strictly in the major metropolitan areas like Tokyo, Kyoto, Osaka. And so, yeah, it's a nice change of pace as well. Now, one other last spoiler thing I kind of wanted to talk about before I end the, this podcast. I know it's getting really long, but... 
We don't quite know if this is the last statue because right now there are no more Straw Hat crew members, but you know, Luffy has invited a bunch of other people, including, you know, a few other characters, but you know, they, they haven't really joined the crew per se. And so, you know, maybe sometime in the future, by the time the series is closer to ending, we may have a few more statues to add to that. So who knows? I may need to go back out there and revisit the other statues and to revisit some of these uh these old ones too because I kind of yeah I kind of want to take more time to be able to just like sit there and really look at the statues because I, as fun as this trip was I was definitely just jumping from one statue to the next for sure because of time and so I think Luffy and Chopper are the only two that where I really got to like just stand there and really look at them for a very long time. Well, that'll do it for this episode. Thanks for uh, sitting here and listening to me talk about my trip for about an hour or so, I think. And uh, yeah, I appreciate it. If you did enjoy this, send me a like or comment. And if you want to join me on this journey of rewatching One Piece, please consider subscribing. I'd greatly appreciate that. Check out my Instagram and Twitter account at Podcast for updates of when I post new episodes. And as always, I wanted to thank you for taking the time out to listen to my podcast. Stay safe out there and I hope to see you on the next episode. Bye.